Well, if you've ever had an extreme bond with an animal, which I know I have so I can relate, today's show, it's one that you'll want to stay tuned for. Our guests today are the team behind a beautiful documentary, The Wild Parrots of Telegraph Hill. Director Judy Irving and the doc star Mark Bittner join us via telephone to discuss this film. Yeah, I'm, I'm just really grateful to that we have this duo on the line here to talk to us today. And, and really, this story was inspired. And, and you know, t- let's talk about the beginnings of how this all came to be. Because, you know, we, we one day we're just hearing all these bird sounds outside of our house and all throughout our neighborhood. You had, you had gone from a walk here and you come back to tell a little bit about the, the background of how this came to be. Well, we were actually doing ADR for Goodbye Promise. And so there were these birds in the background that we could hear. And I went for a walk and I saw all of these green parrots on this this uh, telephone line. Mm -hmm. And so I began to Google it, and that's when it sparked my memory about the doc. And so I said, why don't we call them up and and get them on the show? Yeah, yeah. And they've been gracious enough to to join us. We're really excited. And according to Box Office Mojo, The Wild Parrots of Telegraph Hill ranks as the 48th highest grossing documentary film. The film spotlights Mark Bittner, a musician who had shunned the corporate world, living a life of voluntary uh, simplicity, sometimes homeless and sometimes employed with various odd jobs, uh, who finds meaning in a flock of wild parrots that inhabit the trees outside his apartment where he stayed as a caretaker. Mark viewed his time with the parrots as a diversion from his worries, instead finding that the parrots were part of his true calling. He formed a deep relationship with the birds, despite battles from the city. Yep, and filmmaker Judy Irving contacted Mark, making the documentary and eventually changing both of their lives. Well, we have two guest hosts joining us here in studio today who've traveled all the way from New York. We are screening their film, Cerise, tomorrow night at the Downtown Independent. Mary Nell Montales has worked as a production designer, set director, and she is also the marketing mind behind Cerise, helping the film become one of the early success stories on Indiegogo, raising, I believe, $6,300 on a $5,000 goal. And you can follow her blog at marynell.tumblr.com and also on Twitter at Mary Nell. Our other guest host today says he is a poet. Primarily, John T. Tregonis has published work in a variety of poetry and literary journals all over the world. In 2007, he was a nominee for a Pushcart Prize in Poetry. John has written and directed seven shorts, including Cerise, Speed Musing, Perfect, The Hotel Edwards, and The Coconut. And don't know if a lot of you know about this yet. We'd like to congratulate John for just inking a deal to author the upcoming book, The Tao of Crowdfunding. You can follow John's journey by visiting johntragonis.com and follow him on Twitter at Tragonis. Hi, guys. Hi. How are you? Hi. Great. (laughs) There we are. Yeah, we're we're super thrilled to have you guys in studio with us today. Yeah, yeah, this is is amazing so far. Very cool. Thank you for being here. And I I want you to do me a favor. I want you guys to stay close to the mic because I want to make sure that not only can we hear you, but everyone, yeah, you got to stay uncomfortably close, we like to say. (laughs) Well, I'm pretty uncomfortable right here. (laughs) Okay. It's like I'm going to kiss it. That's cool. Let us welcome to Film Courage, Judy Irving and Mark Bittner. Hello. Hello there. Hi. Hello. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Thank you yes, so much thank, for joining us. Thank you for joining us. For more on Judy and Mark, please visit pelicanmedia.org. And to keep up with Mark's writings, please visit markbittner.net. Judy, we'll start with you first. How large of an influence did your grandfather have on you in becoming a filmmaker? That's an interesting question. Um, my grandfather had a huge influence on me uh, becoming a bird lover. Oh. He, he taught me all about birds when I was about seven, eight years old, and he showed me that I could actually hand feed chickadees in the backyard if I held my hand very still, my palm open. It was really magical to feel those tiny little feet on my fingers when I was a kid. <laughs> um, the The filmmaking part actually came more from my father, who worked for NBC Television in New York. He was a started out as a cameraman, and then he became a technical director. And I grew up hanging out on the sets of the Johnny Carson show and so forth before he moved to L.A. So I, I was used to thinking about shots and angles and and camera and sound and all of that from my dad. Okay, interesting. 
tell us your thought process before you roll camera on a new project. Um, what elements have to be there in order for you to invest your talents in a movie? I have to really love the subject. Um, and in many cases, that has to do with birds. Um, I have made a lot of environmental issue films, and but they're always character-based, and they always have birds in them. I think, I think birds, as avian ambassadors, are really um, the critters that we urban people see most. And so because of that, um, lots of people have experience with birds, and it's, it's easy to get across information and issues and, and um, uh, just important things about the natural world via birds. So I have to really like the subject and be interested to find out more about it myself. Mm -hmm. I think of the documentary process as a process of research and um, you know digging up information about things rather than knowing everything before you roll the camera mm. you know Judy speaking of, of something else you don't have I mean what's fascinating about your process is that when you begin you know you don't have a script you know you have you you know and you often have little or no budget so you are you are really diving into the unknown um, but so so w once you do dive in, how, how do you begin to craft the story, and 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 how do you sort of know what what you're going to film next? <laughs> well, a lot of a lot of uh, film teachers would probably shudder at how I do this, but <clears throat> I you know I I do a little bit of research at the beginning, and then I I dive in and I start shooting, um, and it's way before I have full funding. I do not have. I do not go from a script. Um, I don't necessarily. M my style is not talking heads and B-roll. My that's a that's a style that's derived from news reporting, and I'm not. It's not particularly interesting as a movie style, but a lot of people use it in documentaries. And my style is more like, okay, what scene can I film and how does the scene have a beginning, middle, and end? It's more of a dramatic mm. structure that I'm searching for. I'm searching for characters, and I'm searching for conflict, etc. The same kinds of things that you folks who know all about uh, fiction filmmaking are looking for in a script. But in this case, there is no script. So you're, uh, you're basically pulling it from reality. You're taking it from what's actually happening, and you're trying to surf that wave of uh, the present tense to find a story that's unfolding now. Th this is this is what I like to do anyway. Mm -hmm. A lot lots of folks make films about historical events that are completely in the past, and then of course you'd have to go about it in a in a different way. Mm -hmm. But for a, a contemporary issue or a contemporary person. Or a contemporary story, um, you've got to just dive in and try to make sense of it as you go. Well, in, in that regard, Judy, I mean, are, do you manipulate it ever? I mean, do you ever try to, 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 you know, since you are looking for the beginning, middle, and end of a scene, or do you ever try to say, hey, will you just do this, or, or, or kind of capture um, the moment in that regard? And, uh, well, you can't really manipulate it. Um, on a grand scale, you, you could occasionally ask somebody, you know, could you just come in that door again or whatever if you blew the shot. <laughs> That's, that to me is not, you know, morally suspect. But no, I don't manipulate the story at all. See? I just try to find it and, uh, and uncover it and cover it as it, as it happens. So you, you remain objective and you remain the observer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. I, um, I mean, in, in the case of the wild parrots of Telegraph Hill, I just happened to uh, call Mark and see him feeding the birds and get started on the movie um, nine months before he had to move. Mm -hmm. And um, before that, essentially, you know, although it was unfortunate for Mark... 
uh, it created a very interesting dramatic arc um, mm -hmm. and an ending for the film when he had to leave. Um, so that I, I couldn't know, you know, but it happened while I was filming. Mm -hmm. and, and Judy, one thing I wanted to know, you know, w once you start a, a project, I mean, have you ever, you know, gone into this process since you don't know where what's going to happen next necessarily? I mean, have, have you ever abandoned a project? Uh, no, not really. I mean, you can always figure something out. Uh, each each project, to me, sort of the material itself tells you how to edit it and what what you need to do to bring out the best story. For example, there was a uh, a fabulous old Italian American bay swimmer, open water swimmer that I wanted to do a film about and he had died already um, and I had been filming him over eight years at the South End Rowing Club where I swim in the bay so I had to figure out um, a structure for that film where the sequences went back and forth he had already died in one sequence where folks were having a memorial a very funny memorial for him with stories about him and everything and then back to footage where he was already alive and he was having um, setting records and having a heart attack in the water and all kinds of things that I was able to get um, so in that film the big challenge was uh, time sequence uh, in the parrot film the the big issue was the relationship between Mark and the birds and how that developed and how the characters came to be known both to him and to the audience so I, I think what I would say is that the material itself, in documentary filmmaking, the material itself that you're gathering, kind of, if you're open to it and you're intuitive enough, tells you how to edit it, tells you what the structure should be as you work through it. I just had a quick question, actually, um, coming from a, a storyteller point of view. Um, mm -hmm. Is there ever a moment when you kind of didn't figure out what the story behind something was where you were actually shooting uh, footage uh, you know in the hopes of telling the story but then eventually it came out that there really wasn't any because I know as a, as a writer uh, without spending any money on shooting that would be like a nightmare <laughs> to me if I couldn't figure out wh where this thing was going so I just kind of was curious how, how you handle that or if it's ever happened to you right well there are <clears throat> dead ends that you take definitely <laughs> you, you follow out certain threads and um, in a film that I worked on about the nuclear issue, for instance, nuclear weapons, nuclear power, and, and their, the impact of the industry on ordinary human beings, there were several um, threads that we followed, one of them being radium contamination, that went nowhere. And so that just becomes outtakes. That's all. I mean, in, in the days when I was shooting film, 16 millimeter film, yes, that was an expensive uh, lesson to learn mm, right. but it's also part of trying to uncover the, t the subject and do, and do your research via the filmmaking mm. nice. so yeah you just have to turn away from those paths that don't lead you anywhere I'm wondering too Judy where does your tenacity come from I mean from raising funding for your films to the years that you spend I invested making them why don't you give up <laughs> um, well, first of all, you have to start if, if you're going to get into a process like this, where you're where you're kind of learning about a subject or learning about a person um, or learning about a place via the filmmaking. Y you have to start with something that you're really, really interested in, and then that interest, that curiosity, keeps you going. Uh, also, the fact that you have amassed a certain amount of footage, you've uh, amassed a certain amount of um, information about the subject, uh, storyline is beginning to develop, you know, that kind of thing. You also don't want to disappoint your early funders. Sure. There's all kinds of reasons to keep going. I, I think that um, one of the most important aspects, m one of the most important personality characteristics of uh, filmmakers, both fiction and nonfiction, is tenacity. Okay. Persistence. If you don't have it, you're not going to make it. 
because an awful lot of these projects, and I'm sure you can all vouch for this, take uh, many, many years mm -hmm. to, to, to get done. Interesting. So you just, mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe it's a personality trait that um, you already have it, and then you become a filmmaker. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> they certainly go hand in hand. Uh, Judy, take us to the wild parrots of Telegraph Hill. How, how did you hear of these parrots, and and sort of, and then what kind of drew you to Mark at, at that time? Yeah. Uh, well, I had first seen the parrots when I was swimming in the bay. Um, they were overhead, squawking like crazy, flying past Aquatic Park in San Francisco. <laughs> and then I I had a, a cockatiel, uh, my own little pet bird, and I, had, I was reading Bird Talk magazine one, do, one day, and I read an article that Mark had written about his relationship with the parrots. That was in 1995, years and years before I started the movie. And then later... Two friends, I had made a film about blue herons at uh, Golden Gate Park, just a kid's film, a little short kid's film. Mm. When I showed that, um, there was a birder in the audience, and he said, oh, you got to make a film about this guy who feeds the parrots. And a, a friend who worked at the library had also told me the same thing. So I felt like, okay, these two friends are telling me the same thing. I better call this guy up. So that's how it happened friends pointed me in the right direction and I went over there and saw him feeding them and thought oh this is this is pretty great you know the, the birds are very colorful but I'm not sure about Mark <laughs> <laughs> that was my first impression interesting so when you first started filming parrots was the core idea to film the story of the birds or was it more to tell Mark's story it was both okay. it was to make a movie about Mark's relationship with the birds okay. and Mark was indispensable because he is a great storyteller mm -hmm. and he knew the birds and he knew their personalities could describe them and as I got to hear more and more of these stories I realized oh if I could film those particular birds doing those things or whatever or being cuddly with each other like he talks about Picasso and Sophie for instance um <laughs> then I then I could get the beginnings of a good movie here. So it was it was both right from the start. It was the relationship between mm. a person and these wild creatures mm. right in the city. Now Mark, pr prior to Judy, you must have had hundreds of tourists and, and locals who snapped photos of you um, with the parrots, and, and there must have been, you know, among those, I'm sure those get capturing you on video. What what made Judy stand out amongst the others? Well, uh, <clears throat> there was, she was the first serious person. I, I, I mean, I was hoping somebody would come along because I, want, I knew I was going to end it at a certain point, and I wanted to have a visual record because it was so visual, just something to keep a little souvenir, so to speak. And there was one guy who came along, and he, no, two people came along that were both interested in shooting videos, and that was all I was looking for, and that was fine, but in both cases, the projects fell through. And then she came along, and she had a track record, and she was more serious, and, you know, I didn't know where it was going to go, neither one of us did, but I trusted her, and so, you know, whatever she wanted to do was fine. And, and it just kept developing from, Originally, she was just going to make a short little film, and then she was going to make a kid's film, a short kid's film, and then it just kept developing into what it finally became. And, and, and how did she first approach you, and, and, and what made you comfortable? Because that, that's always what I wonder. Any, anytime there's a documentary film and you're, and you're dealing with... Um you know, you're dealing with people. It's like, you know, when a stranger comes in and says, I want to put you on camera, you know, I, you know, it, it, I, I would be apprehensive I, myself. Okay. So I always wonder how other people handle it. Well, I wasn't nervous about the camera because I had a friend who was a film student and she had me as the lead in two little experimental films she made. So that was, <laughs> that, that didn't bother me. Um, when she called me, it felt fine to me, although I started getting nervous in the interim before she actually showed up, because I didn't know. I mean, I was living 
an unusual lifestyle and you know very few people actually ever came inside my house and saw what was going on <laughs> and I was a little bit nervous but you know she seemed mature she was adult so you know I just relaxed I didn't worry about it mm-hmm. and, and what do you remember of that first encounter <laughs> well I, I I had this house filled with sick birds <laughs> and you know, and the place was damp. It's, it was against the hillside. It was a very old building. You can't really tell this in the film, but I mean, the walls were moist. It had a smell of mold, and but it was free. You know, that's one reason I was living there. It was it was a roof. So I remember her coming in, and I remember her being actually quite <laughs> even level about it. But I guess she was more surprised she showed it just seemed fine she just seemed adult that's all Mm -hmm. (laughs) thank you and then judy you have a a sort of a paraphrased quote about mark that i wanted to read because it really struck me and you said he didn't want to be on a career path the parrots were a diversion when you start doing something you love look carefully at it because it might just be your path can you expand on that yeah um I think often people um, discard what they really love to do and they feel that that's not important or it's not what they should be doing or it's not, you know, maybe doesn't make enough money. But if you really love doing it, um, you might want to look more carefully at it because you'll have the energy and the tenacity and the interest to possibly make it into something that can really work for you um, more than just a hobby or a diversion. Mm -hmm. And in Mark's case, he was sort of reading a lot of philosophy and Eastern philosophy and Western philosophy and history and all kinds of things and trying to figure out the meaning of life. And and then these birds came visiting at his... um, uh, deck there and he started feeding them and just kept telling himself oh, I've got to stop this this is too time consuming it's so much fun and I'm learning so much about these birds but this is just a diversion this is not this is not helping my search my my spiritual search my philosophical search and so and then and and Mark you should probably be talking about this yourself Go ahead. <laughs> well, I was, um, I sort of left everything in 1973, and I spent the next 14 years essentially without an address, no home. And then I got this, I landed this thing as caretaking, as a caretaker of this big house. And so it seemed like, okay, I've been struggling along for 14 years. I need to really get serious because I won't have this forever, and I'm, the next time I have to go out there, I want to know which way I'm going. And then these parrots came along. And at first I saw them as a diversion, um, but they were an enjoyable diversion. But as I got pulled deeper into it, I mean, I just kept finding resonances that were really helpful to me in general. And, you know, there's, to me, there's, you know, I know a lot of people don't believe this kind of stuff, but there's no doubt in my mind that I was supposed to do this. And it changed everything in my life. It was like, it was a door I walked through, and everything improved. Everything got better for me. Mm-hmm. And they answered questions that I had about how the mind works. Um, I was able to start making a living in a way that I wanted to. I learned all kinds of things, um, skills. <clears throat> com- I, you know, I was, I was completely outside of the computer world. I didn't know anything about computers. I had no idea what they even did. Mm-hmm. And because of them, I was writing a book. Somebody said, oh, well, you'll need a computer. And I didn't even understand what he meant by that. So, But he gave me his old computer, and so I got into that. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, they really did change everything that I was going through. And, you know, it's worked out very well for me. So what looked to me like a diversion turned out not to be at all. 
and it was something that I was just loving doing. I mean, I looked at them as friends. I didn't look at them as anything else, really. I mean, once I started, I, I wrote a book, and once I started getting into the research of the book, I started getting more, a little more scientific about it, or at least I started going to science-type books to understand more about certain things. But first and foremost, they were always friends to me, and that's how I enjoyed them. Now, you were a musician for many years, and you said you reached a point where you realized that it wasn't in you to have that as a, a path. How did you come to this decision, and what was it about being in music that just wasn't in you? <laughs> well, that's actually a little bit inaccurate, oh. but that's how the story's been told over the years. I'm working on a book right now, which will clarify all this, but... okay. I had wanted to be a musician for a long time, but ne I had a big conflict inside of myself as to whether I really was a musician or not. I have the feeling that certain people are born to do certain things. Um, I have some ability as a musician, but I wasn't really passionate about it, I guess you'd say, and I kept trying to find the devotion I needed, the discipline I needed to be a good musician, but I couldn't do it. So finally, push came to shove, I went out and tried it, and I found rather quickly that it was a mistake. I wasn't a musician. It just was, you know, it wasn't the center of my love, but the time that I was growing up in, musicians were like, you know, the singer-songwriter was sort of regarded as the poet of the time. And that appealed to me a lot. I wanted to be one of those. I wanted to have something to say. And the idea was that people were saying it through music then, so I wanted to get into that. But it just wasn't really what I was born to do. So I had to leave all of that behind. It really only took me about seven or eight months for the whole thing to come crashing down. I was serious about it for seven or eight months. And then it fell apart. So, and I actually was making a living at it, but it was just driving me crazy. It wasn't, mm. it wasn't satisfying me. Now, you say that the parrots were your friends. So we want to talk about something that you touch on in the film, and that is attributing you know, human characteristics to an animal. Right. And you said that they fear death, they get jealous, they love, they mourn, and that these birds have these emotions that we all feel. And, uh, you know, anyone who's ever been close to an animal can attest to this, but there's so many out there who feel that this is not true and that, you know, their brains are smaller than ours. Can you dispel these myths? I don't think I can change anybody's mind. I think an experience is really the only thing that's going to change most people's minds. But, you know, <clears throat> I think that characteristics, character, are universal. I mean, it's universal to mind. See, we have this, there are sort of like three views of existence now. One is the scientific view, which says it's all just physics and chemistry. There's the creator God idea where there was this God that created material and some of it's alive and some of it's not. And then there's the everything is God idea. And, you know, the mind is, everything is the mind. The whole universe is the mind. And that's the one I subscribe to. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, all of these characteristics are present in existence. And all living creatures partake of these same characteristics. They're not exclusive to human beings. Human beings might have more characteristics. They have a broader range. But, you know, they exist in animal, animals identically. I mean, it's, it's all recognizable to you as a human being what they're going through a lot of the time. Sometimes not because they have different biological concerns. Um, they don't store food, for example, so they have to be constantly looking for food. So I'm sure that motivates them to do certain things that might be a little bit more difficult to understand. But when you see jealousy and when you see rage, when you see humor, I mean, they're, they're very funny. And it's all very transparent when you're actually dealing with it one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. So I realized after a while that the problem is not anthropomorphism, it's anthropocentrism. We human beings think we're the center <laughs> you know, God's gift to the world, that kind of thing. It's, and it's just not true. Yeah, and I think, Judy, you had mentioned in a prior interview that watching the film may actually help someone overcome feelings of loneliness or depression, knowing that we're just such a small part in this big picture. Right, and it's, it's not to try to diminish us, but to try to enlarge 
our understanding of the universe beyond just human concerns. Um, I think a lot of people, particularly folks who live in cities, are lonely. And it's easy to be lonely in a city. It's easy to just look down at the concrete or up at the electric wires and think, you know, what's the use kind of thing. But if you get yourself, if you just get yourself out there into nature and look around a little bit, um, you'll see that there are, um, th there's a whole world out there, really, literally, that we've kind of forgotten about. Sure. Most people have forgotten about. And if you open yourself up to it, it just uh, not only is a more accurate view of the, the world that we live in, but it also makes you feel better to know that we share this planet with all these creatures. And then you start feeling, well, you know, God, I have, I have a responsibility to try to make sure that these other critters do okay. I'm, I'm making a film right now about California brown pelicans. It's actually my favorite bird. <laughs> and uh, it's called Pelican Dreams. And as I film um, these individual pelicans that I'm getting to know in a variety of contexts and also um, more general sequences at their breeding grounds and nesting grounds and so forth in Southern California, the Channel Islands, I'm realizing that, you know, as people fall in love with pelicans through this film, they're also going to fall in love with the coast the whole West Coast, because that's where pelicans live. So it's all interconnected, and it, it broadens um, your your view, and it makes you feel a part of something bigger. Mark, I'm wondering, how did you handle the death of these various birds that had come to be your friends? Well, that was very difficult for me at first, actually, because I think I say that in the movie, but I for some strange reason, and I'd been noticing it for years, I'd never had a friend or, or someone who was close to me die. That had just stayed away from me for years and years. <clears throat> I was in my 40s by the time that finally happened to me, and it was the death of a bird. And it was devastating. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it really tore me apart, because I love that little bird. I'd put, that's Tupelo, it's a... Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Put years... No, excuse me. I'd put months into that bird's care. It was dying. But I didn't really see that. But they live shorter lives than we do, and eventually I did get used to it. But um, at first it was very hard for me. And I think it had a lot to do with the level of concern and care I was putting into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Uh, I mean, you put all of this energy into trying to keep something alive, and then it dies. Right. Yeah, no, it is devastating. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, you know, this this is Film Courage on LATalkRadio.com. Our guests today are Judy Irving and Mark Bittner of the film The Wild Parrots of Telegraph Hill. We are joined in studio by our guest hosts, Mary Nell Montelez and John Tregonis, and they're just kind of taking in the whole experience. Mm -hmm. You know, Mark, the mainstream, I'm just going to take an opposite approach here for a second. The mainstream kind of grooms us from the time we're little to make these career decisions to work tirelessly at it and then retire. But instead, you chose something else. You chose to study alternative methods of thinking and philosophy and Eastern religions. Why is that? <clears throat> well, I <laughs> one day I was walking down the street and I, I was suffering over the loss of a girl. This was when I was 14 years old. Or I thought I was. And I was just I was just devastated. I was feeling downer and downer, and <clears throat> I started looking around me. I don't know why. I mean, just my my mind started looking at the houses around me. It was this suburban mall type area, and it, it suddenly seemed to me that that was not the cause of my sorrow. Ultimately, the sorrow was the emptiness of the world I was growing up in, and I'd had a feeling all my life that you know we we know that we have this one chance to live and it should be a rich experience. Instead, it's just this mind-numbing thing. 
that you know like all my <clears throat> my parents were just saying oh stop thinking that way just you know do it you know go to school get a job that's what life's really about and i didn't believe it and that day as i was walking through all of these houses and feeling just this deep deep misery i said no i i this can't be the way and i just swore to myself that i was not going to let myself live that way. I didn't know what that meant. I mean, it really was a matter of saying, you know, every time I'd come to a branch in the road where it was career and all of that, or <clears throat> look for something more alive, I just took the road that was more alive. and wasn't a plan. It, it, I don't think anybody ever really plans that kind of thing. It just mm. it's what I could handle psychologically. I could not handle the idea of becoming a mummy. Sure. <laughs> how it felt like to me so mm -hmm. I just kept going that way and another thing that I actually I think is very important was the counterculture was alive at that time it was very strong and there was a feeling you know there were a lot of people out there trying to live alternative lives and there were little alternative biz businesses so it didn't feel like such a long shot it didn't feel like it was something you were doing all by yourself out on your own and I think since the collapse of the counterculture, it's uh, a lot harder. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it has to happen again. Because I don't think the way of life, like, you know, we keep using the word sustainable. It is not sustainable. We cannot keep living this way. You know, along those lines, Mark, you know, wh wh when does life change? You know, because it feels, you know, at least, I don't know if it's our, our age or just the fact that we are, we are trying to pursue, you know, this, you know our, ourselves trying to pursue uh, filmmaking. So many people listen to the show trying to, t trying to pursue filmmaking. But, but it feels like now more than ever that life is filled with uncertainty. Um, you know, especially when you're going after life's passion, you, you don't know what's around the corner if you're ever right. going to get there. Um, and for you, after living years of, of living homelessly, you know, as a homeless and, and, and not having this steady career path, um, you know, what, what, what made the difference? What, what, was there a defining moment that, that made that difference? Well, I think there were a series of moments. I, see, I think my, my own faith is that if you live for what's really real inside of yourself you hook up with where you should be and there is a way of making it other than you know the the usual career paths so i mean i've had a very unusual story i you know i recognize that but i had to take a lot of chances it would seem from the outside it looks to people i think like i've taken a lot of risks but I don't feel that way. I don't. I just feel like, you know, I kept doing what I liked, and when the going got tough, I just hung in there because I just couldn't handle doing something I didn't like. I think that's part of it. You know, I, I get bored with stuff that doesn't mean anything to me, and I just can't imagine living a life that I don't love. I mean, I only have this one chance here. <laughs> that's the thing that keeps coming back to me. Mm -hmm. So... I, but I don't think it's a crapshoot in the sense of luck. I think that if you do what is really your thing, that was an expression everybody had, you know, do your thing. But if you do what's really your thing, what's really true inside of you, it hooks up with whatever you need to make it work. That's a really hard thing to accept, I think, especially right now because we've come to a, an extreme, we're in an extreme materialist time where that kind of thing seems like a fantasy to people. And we're also addicted to the idea of getting more. But I think I think it, when a little bit farther down the line, we're going to see that this is a real historical turning point this time right now that we're in. That's why things feel so strange. I don't think we're going to go back to what has been considered normal. I don't think it's possible. Anymore. In reading the comments on Amazon for the film, this one man put a very interesting comment, and he said that he applauded you and he said that he made much more money than he felt he was really entitled to and he wished that he could give it all up and search for something that satisfied him uh, but he didn't have enough time and he didn't want to give up that status <laughs> so what would you say to someone like that well you know I, what I would say but it would be too glib is well <laughs> just do it <laughs> That's too, you know I, it's very hard for me to I never advise anybody to do what I did because 
it has to be done from inside of them. You know, you cannot, it's like sending somebody over a cliff if, if they went ahead and did it because you told them to do it. But they have to want to do it themselves. Um, I think circumstance is going to force people to live a different kind of life pretty soon. I think it's starting to do that now. Yeah. You know, it's, there's the matter of we're running out of resources, we've got these huge debts, we have this vast imperial system, so this military thing spread all around the globe, and it's unsustainable. But also, I think psychologically, the way we're living, you get up and you, you know, just do all of this stuff all day long, and then you get some entertainment at the end of the day and crash. We can't, it's not sustainable. You can't keep living that way. We're not, as living beings, we're meant to do something else. And this is, what we've been living is a diversion. And, you know, eventually we're going to get forced into doing stuff that matters, and that's fine. I mean, but it may feel like pressure for a while. Good. I'm I'm a little bit apocalyptic, I think, in my thinking, but I think the time's bearing it out, mm -hmm. actually. You, you know, l let's come back um, to these parrots for a moment, uh, Mark. Because, <laughs> <Sure. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, I have something else, you know, that, that I find pretty interesting here. You know, you mentioned... Um, in the documentary, um, that, that's something that you wanted to do, or I don't know if it was in the documentary, or it might have been in an inter interview, uh, you, you wanted to make the birds so famous that it would be um, harder um, for them to lose some of their rights um, in the talk of the radicals wanting to get rid of the birds because they yeah. were a non-native species. You know, at, at, what, at what point did those kind of thoughts enter your mind, and, and what gave you the confidence that that goal could ever be achieved? Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to correct one thing that you had in the introduction. You said that uh, you, you said something about my having to fight with the city or struggle with the city. The city actually has been very helpful in mm -hmm. all of this, but I think it's partly because of their fame. I <clears throat> I was told by a there was a guy studying a flock of parrots in Chicago, and he'd been following what I'd been doing. I had a little website for a while. There was no book, no film. There was just this little website, and he'd been following it. And he said, well, you know, one thing you need to do is you need to make these birds famous because a lot of these flocks of parrots, there's a lot of flocks all across the United States. It's not just San Francisco and L.A. They're everywhere. Well, they're not everywhere, but they're in quite a few places. <clears throat> so he said you need to make them famous because there are organizations that are opposed to all um, non-native species and... The flock that he was studying had been under a lot of pressure from the state. They wanted to exterminate them. So he said, if you make them famous, that will be, you know, it'll be harder for them to do. That's what convinced me to write a book, actually. And then when Judy came along with the idea to do a film, you know, I didn't really, I couldn't say, oh, yeah, well, <laughs> we'll make a feature-length film that he got in the theaters. That wasn't my thought. But anything that could make the birds present for other people, could only help, I figured. So it was a gradual process, but that's indeed what did happen. They are little celebrities here in the city. Um, you know, nobody's going to be able to order their extermination. You know, the, the idea as to whether that's right or not, whether they should be here because they're non-native, is a whole other argument. And I, I fall on a particular side of it. But their fame was, my hope was that it would create the situation that they are now in, where they're, you know, beloved, so nobody's going to come along and try to get rid of them. Like saying, you know, tearing down the Golden Gate Bridge at this point or something. In the, the topic of fame, how are you handling your own celebrity? Well, it's fading. <laughs> it's fading? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was funny. I, I, I've always sort of I wanted to be famous when I wanted to be a musician. And then when I got out of that, I said, well, that's ridiculous wanting to be famous. That's a terrible thing to want to be. So I've been through both sides of it. And then, you know, my fame, I don't even consider it fame, but, you know, people do recognize me on the street. And people are always nice, but you see that it's really, we have this idea of fame in the culture, which is really kind of bizarre. People respond to me. I used to be a guy on the street, and people would, you know, treat me like dirt. <laughs> and then, 
now I'm sort of like this. Sometimes I get treated like a little prince. <laughs> and it doesn't make any sense, you know. I'm the same person. It so, uh -huh. I mean, that doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen occasionally. You notice that something's different, you know. You know, Ju Judy, we're in our final seconds. I mean, did you ever imagine the, the wild pair at the Telegraph Hill would, would have the impact that it's had? No, I didn't, but I'm very glad that it did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank oh, you. We'd like to thank you so much, Judy and Mark, uh, for taking the time to share your stories with us. You know, I've been watching the film on Amazon now every night for the past few days and uh, just really love it. And thank you so much for agreeing to the interview. Thank you. That thank really you. It means a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, we, we've loved having you on. We, you know, yeah. we, we loved um, just hearing more about your story and, and just really talking life and philosophy and, mm -hmm. and just soaking this all in. Yeah. Um, and keep going with Film Courage. It's great. Oh, thank you. Oh, we appreciate, oh, appreciate it. appreciate that. Yeah. That means a lot. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank I'll you. I'll second that. All right. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, it means a lot that you two would join us here today. Yeah, it really does. You. you know, we also like to thank our guest host today <laughs> that, <laughs> that just really just wanted to soak in the experience of being in the studio, uh, John Tregonis and Marinelle Montelez. Um, stay connected with John by visiting com. Stay connected with Marinelle by visiting com. And they're both on Twitter, at Tregonis and at Mary Nell. I want to come back to Judy and Mark for a second. Sure. Um, you want to follow up on them, you can visit pelicanmedia.org. And if you want to keep up with Mark's writings, uh, visit markbittner.net. Um, we'd like to thank our guy, Ronan Rosner. He's yeah, the sort of you, our Ronan. radio angel technician here at LA Talk Radio. Uh, he's always watching over us here at the studio. He's also the architect behind filmcurs.com. And until next Sunday, have a great week.